So welcome everybody to the construction training marathon session. Um, I didn't pack a lunch. I hope you guys did. I just have a jar of peanuts next to me. My name's Dan Morrison. I'm the editor of Pro Tradecraft, which is a technical journal built for your phone. Uh, uh, anyway, we're going to be talking or covering um, thermal envelope improvements in residential construction today in a series of five different sessions. We'll look at high performance walls um, and roofs. And then, but before we dig into the specifics of how to improve the shell, we'll look at the basic physics of heat and water movement and explore why it matters when designing a building, um, designing and building better enclosures. I'm gonna, throughout the day, I'll be using a series of animations and videos that I developed for Pro Tradecraft based on um, real job sites, uh, visiting job sites and shooting video on job sites. Uh, we'll follow a few houses that are being super insulated and tightened up, mostly focusing on a couple of crews who did uh, the majority of the work. So building blocks of building science. So generally, when we talk about the building blocks of building science, we focus on heat, air, and moisture. Um, and before going any farther, I just wanna say, I'm not a physicist, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a building official. I'm a former framing carpenter turned remodeler turned editor when my knees and back started giving out and I saw an ad in fine home building magazine looking for an assistant editor. Um, my first big score at fine home building was getting an article by Dr. Joe Stebrick, the Mac daddy of BS. And through Dr. Joe, I've come to meet and work with a lot of North America's leading engineers, architects, builders, remodelers, and trade contractors. So I'm not pretending to have figured out this stuff by myself. I just make friends with smart people and get invited to their parties and um, to their job sites too. Okay, so heat, as you know, works in a few ways, conduction, convection, and radiation, but really all three are working pretty much together all the time. So it's really a matter of balance, not a matter of which type you're talking about. Um, air movement, as you know, can be in any direction. It can go up, down, sideways, or it could go multiple directions at the same time. Moisture not only moves a few ways, but it also takes different forms, right? So ice cubes, water, and steam are kind of the everyday examples. Um, ice dams, rain, humidity, and condensation are the typical building science examples. And so like heat, heat, air, and moisture don't work in a vacuum. They work together pretty much always. So they kind of gang up on your building assembly to you know, have their way with it. They're controlled with what Dr. Joe calls control layers, a water control layer, a thermal control layer, an air control layer, and then keeping those control layers continuously connected from the footing to the ridge. So first we'll look at heat flow. To do that, I'm gonna use an episode of a podcast that I produce called Seven Minutes of BS, which is seven minutes of building science. Um, but rather than make you sit and listen to a podcast first thing in the morning, I made the podcast into a little video that we can watch as a group. Today we're gonna to discuss heat flow. This is Seven Minutes of BS. Building science with a beat. I'm Dan Morrison, editor of Pro Tradecraft. Heat flow is the movement of heat energy between objects from a hot temperature to a cold temperature. And that is Jonathan Smeagol from RDH Building Science Laboratories. We know that heat moves from hot to cold, but it's not always clear on how it moves. So it moves in one of three ways, either by conduction, convection, or radiation. More often than not, though, heat is moving in more than one way at once. Conduction is probably the best understood of the three, and it's simply the transfer of heat through molecular contact, which is just the geeky way of saying when two things of different temperatures are in contact with each other, and you get heat transfer from hot to cold. Um, for example, if you pick up a hot pan, uh, the heat transfers to your fingers from the pan and you get burned. If you stick your tongue against a cold metal pole in the winter, then the heat from the surface of your tongue transfers very quickly to the pole and you end up freezing your tongue directly to the pole. So if you learn nothing else from this podcast, learn this. Always, no, wait, never touch your tongue to a cold flagpole. So that's conduction. And, and like I said, it's usually the easiest to understand. Convection is a process of moving heat through fluids. In construction, those fluids are usually air or water. 
So in a lot of cases, we have pumps that move heated fluid into radiators or radiant floors. So that's the majority of the water part. Let's look at air, the majority of convective activity through the building enclosure. And even for what might seem like small air flows, especially in a well-insulated enclosure, this convection, this air movement through the building will dominate the heat loss across the enclosure. Dominate the heat loss across the enclosure. Dominate the heat loss across the enclosure. That's an important point that answers the why it matters question, and we'll come back to that in a bit. The fluid convection talked about earlier is what's called forced convection, because there were pumps, fans, or some kind of mechanical power behind the movement. Another example of convection would be what we call natural convection. So because warm air is less dense and cooler air is more dense, we often get stratification of air and movement against surfaces. Natural convection is when air moves based on the temperature difference. As the air cools, it will become denser, it will fall and be replaced by warmer, less dense air. For example, if you're standing against a large window, the air in the room will cool as it comes in contact with that window and it will fall down the surface of the window, often leading to condensation in the bottom corners. Just like the convective current that rolls past your window and drops condensation at the bottom, Little convective loops in the stud cavities can mean little lumps of water in your wall. Also within wall assemblies, within enclosures, in air permeable insulation, if you don't do a good job installing insulation in your, your stud cavities, you can get convective looping in your stud cavities. Okay, that's the high and low on convective heat flow, fluids carrying heat. The last form of heat transfer is radiation. Radiation heat transfer is a bit more complicated to understand because you, because you can't observe it in the ways that you can observe conduction or convection. Radiation can go through clear surfaces such as windows, it can go through vacuums like space and vacuum insulated panels, but it cannot go through solid objects. The most obvious, important, and probably easy to understand example of radiant heat flow is the sun. In thermal envelope world, that heat can be either wanted or unwanted, depending on the season and where you live. In general, people don't understand radiative heat transfer as well. When it comes to radiation heat transfer and the opaque enclosure, there could be confusion in how radiant barriers, foils, low E coatings on surfaces can work. I happen to know that there's a whole podcast on the topic of radiant barriers, so dig into that if you're still hungry. The radiation heat transfer is simply two surfaces of different temperature that are radiating through space to each other to try and even out the temperature difference between those two surfaces. If you have a warm surface and a cold surface and they can see each other, they will try to come to an equilibrium temperature by radiating heat or cold to each other. For example, when you stand next to a cold wall or window, you feel the cold even without touching it because your heat is radiated away. The cold wall sucks heat away from you. It literally sucks to be standing there. So if you touch the cold wall, that's conduction. If you feel a cold draft coming off the wall, that's convection. When you feel the heat sucked out of you, that's radiation. Even though all three of these modes are relatively straightforward when it comes to the enclosure buildings and enclosure components, all three modes of heat flow work simultaneously. Usually though, one form is dominant over the other. Which can make it difficult to understand exactly what's going on with heat transfer. The three modes of heat transfer could change as heat moves through a wall assembly and they would end up acting in series in some walls or even in parallel depending on the type and complexity of the wall system. To illustrate, Jonathan sketches out a bare concrete wall with no insulation above ground on a sunny day. Let's just say we have a concrete exterior wall. It's concrete all the way through from the interior to the exterior. There's no insulation, just to simplify this example. And so we have the radiation from the sun coming down the building and heating up the surface of the concrete. So that's radiative heat transfer from the sun to the exterior surface of the concrete. From there, the concrete gets quite warm, as you would expect, and the heat transfer through the concrete itself is largely and almost entirely by conduction. There's not a lot of spaces in that concrete for convection or radiation heat transfer. But when the heat gets to the other side, it changes again. To radiation again, but... And now it's a different radiation than when the sun was radiating. It's an infrared spectrum radiation, a much lower temperature. Whereas the radiation from the sun was in the ultraviolet spectrum, a much hotter spectrum to sit in. But the heat doesn't stop with infrared radiation. The heated interior surface of the concrete, once again, creates convection currents. So that surface will heat up, it will cause the air adjacent to that surface to rise, and you will get radiative and convective heat transfer off the interior of that surface. 
So just in that very simple example of a concrete wall, we have all three methods of heat transfer working to move heat from the exterior to the interior space. In pretty much any place that a building will be made of concrete walls, there's going to be a need to insulate those concrete walls. A common way to insulate that concrete wall is on the interior, put on steel studs, fiberglass bat, and interior gypsum board. So what happens then? Well, we have the sun heating the wall, the wall getting warm, the heat moving to the interior surface. But instead of radiating directly to the interior now, steel studs in direct contact with that concrete are warmed by conduction. Concrete heats up, studs are in contact, we have molecular contact, and we have heat transfer to the studs. In between the steel studs, we do have some fiberglass bat, which do a pretty good job of insulating the concrete. It re they really limit the conduction, the radiation, and the convection between the spaces. But this is a prime example of defective R-value losses as a result of thermal bridging of steel studs. All of the heat will be conducted around the insulation to the interior surface of the drywall, and that is where you have your radiation and convective heat transfer. To reiterate, the majority of the heat flows around the insulation through the steel studs and it heats up the drywall. All three types of heat flow work together to move heat, and each type's proportion of importance depends on the assembly, where the heat is located within the assembly, and where the assembly is located within the world. In colder climates, heat flow reductions are typically done by specifying higher R values of insulation and higher air tightness values to minimize both the largest sources of conduction and convection heat loss. Windows are predominantly important for heat loss in cold climates, whereas in hot climates, they're the main source of heat gain. So they sabotage boilers in the north and AC units in the south. In the warmer, more southern climate, solar control is typically the key to thermal control and comfort. Air tightness is important, but as a generalization, air tightness is not as critical, and the R value levels do not need to be as high to maintain interior comfort. Radiant barriers in the roof assembly, shading, and low E coatings on windows is how radiant heat flow is slowed. So knowing how to stop the flow is one aspect of solving the puzzle. Knowing why helps to dial in the strategy. The biggest reason to control heat flow in buildings is actually for occupancy comfort. If you can control drafts, you can eliminate complaints about drafts. You'll also reduce condensation problems which can lead to musty air and rotten wood. Controlling heat flow also saves money for whoever pays the utility bills. A better thermal envelope means that you can cut down the size of the mechanical equipment that heat and cool the building. The operational energy savings are critical because once you finish the building, they're the main cost that you have to operate that building for the entire life of the building. So if you can minimize the operational cost right off the bat, then for 50, 75, 100 years, you're going to keep saving money year after year. And that's a pretty smart approach to building design. Turns out, you get paid for what you do and what you know. When you know more, you can do more. Um, so that's the three ways that heat can flow through a building enclosure. And controlling heat flow comes down to prioritizing really the mechanisms of heat flow, right? So most radiant heat flow is through windows. Um, in Minnesota, you probably want to, you want, you want that free heat that radiates through the windows in the winter, but you probably don't want heat sucked out of your body when you sit next to that window in the evening. Um, so, and you probably know the best solution for Northern climate people is triple glazed windows with a higher R value or, you know, lower U value and a coating that allows radiant heat to enter the house, but not to suck it away from you. So that's usually a high solar heat gain rating on the window st sticker, uh, SHGC is the rating. Um, so that's radiant. Most convective heat flow is due to air leaks, as it said earlier, because warm air rises, holes in the ceiling will allow that warm air to escape while sucking cold air in at the first floor. So there's a really cool episode of uh, seven minutes of BS about stack effect, which explains why revolving doors were invented and um, talks about a tower in Australia that sucks warm air in at the bottom and has a wind, wind turbine at the top. I think they're actually even building one of those in Arizona soon. Um, but you can check that out if you're interested in stack effect. The next one, most conductive heat flow is from thermal bridging, which was shown in that animation, where heat flows around insulation rather than getting trapped in it, which is what the insulation wants it to do. So let's take a closer look at thermal bridging that Jonathan was talking about earlier. Thermal bridging. 
This is 7 Minutes of BS. Building science. I'm Dan Morrison, editor of Pro Tradecraft. A thermal bridge uh, is an area of the building enclosure, whether it be the walls or roof or foundation. And that's Jonathan Smeagol of RDH Building Science Labs in Waterloo, Ontario. That has significantly higher heat flow than intended. There's areas or components of the wall assembly that transfer the heat quicker than the insulation around it. For example, if we had a R20 fiberglass bat, which everybody's familiar with, in a wood stud wall, we get approximately an effective R value of R15, not the R20 that the insulation says it performs as. Even though the insulation goes to work every day, the studs undermine it. And so that's because the heat isn't actually flowing through the insulation, it's flowing through the higher conductivity components. Especially if you use metal studs. Wood has an R value of about R1 per inch. Metal studs have an R value of like a millionth of an R per mile. As a comparison, if you put R20 bat into a steel stud wall, you get an effective R value of approximately R4. Remembering back to our grade school number lines, 4 is less than 20. The math behind heat loss is not quite as easy as R value suggests, and we'll talk about that in a future episode. But for now, we'll say that insulation between the framing doesn't stop all the heat flow through a wall, floor, or roof assembly. And this always happens when you have structural components that pass through the insulation. Okay, call off the search. We found the weakest link. Structural components refuse to play nice with insulation. And it's not just a play date problem. It's a problem for builders and remodelers who are just trying to do their job. Because we're getting, getting building, building codes. codes that are saying you need to meet an effective R value of R20 instead of installing R20 bats and achieving an effective R value of R15. So you cannot look at the package and pretend you're getting R20 when you install the insulation. But it's not just about meeting the code. The other reasons it matters is the energy bills are going to be higher when you have heat loss uh, through the thermal bridging of the wall assembly. Energy prices tend to go up. So an investment in using less energy is an investment that pays bigger dividends every year. It is especially good for older people who are on fixed incomes and want to control costs. Turns out, though, that energy movement through thermal bridges can cause water damage, too. Because thermal Thermal bridging bridging inside inside the the enclosure enclosure can lead to cold spots. And you can have condensation and moisture accumulation. You can see this on ceiling joists, sometimes in rooms below attics, in the form of staining. staining or... Uh, aesthetic issues on both the interior and exterior. It happens when moisture condenses on the cold spot and sucks up to dust. And then you get ghosting of the particular uh, structural members. And you can see it on your neighbor's houses too. You can get them on both the interior and the exterior. It used to just be a hobby of energy nerds to look at people's roofs in the winter and mutter thermal bridging under their breath. But nowadays, mainstream trades peeps can join the fun. As energy codes progress, the energy rating index targets will likely get more aggressive and cold studs will become a bigger slice of the problematic pie. Fortunately for us, deep energy true believers have been building and remodeling for a while, so there's quite a track record of what works and what doesn't. Probably the two most common ways of dealing with thermal bridging are thick stud walls. Double stud walls. Where we have essentially two framed walls, an interior framed wall and an exterior framed wall. So the framing isn't connected all the way through. And then we fill that space, whether it be 10, 11, 12 inches with insulation. Uh, Often it can be blown in bad or dense packed cellulose. And that way, none of the framing members are continuous in the wall assembly. However, houses are made of more than just walls. In those cases, we typically still have floor joists and other structural parts that go from the interior to the exterior. Spray foaming the rim joist will add air sealing and R value, but it will not eliminate the thermal bridge for every floor joist telegraphing through the rim. But we definitely reduce the the amount of thermal bridging. And it will stop moisture from reaching the rim better than insulation that doesn't air seal as part of the package. The other technique that reduces thermal bridging is a continuous insulation, a CI approach. Effectively wrapping the bones of the house in a blanket of insulation. Where we put exterior insulation on the uh, outside of the building, outside of the structure. So that the bones remain at a consistent temperature through the seasonal shifts. None of the structure reaches the exterior. 
and reduces the thermal bridging from the interior to the exterior in that way. But you still need to fasten the roofing and siding through the foam to the house. There's a couple of ways to do that too. For typical asphalt shingle roofs, you can put a layer of roof sheathing, either OSB or plywood, over the foam and proceed as normal. A metal roof could be fastened into furring strips laid horizontally across the roof. Walls are similar. If you want cedar shingles on the walls, you have to skin them with sheathing. If you're doing lap siding or panel siding, you can screw one by furring strips into the studs through the foam as a solid backing for the siding. With the exterior insulation, usually the only thermal bridges are the fasteners that fasten the cladding or the strapping through from the outside of the building to the structure. Adding furring strips to the roof or walls also adds a vented airspace to the assembly, which promotes drying and stops BMR. That stands for Bugs, Mold, and Rot, and it's how we'll end the very first seven minutes of BS Podcast. I'm Dan Morrison, urging you to remember, you get paid for what you do and what you know. And you can only do so much, but information is infinite. Learn more with Pro Tradecraft. Okay, so that's heat flow. Um, now we can look at air movement within and through building assemblies. Um, okay, so air generally moves in a house from one of three mechanisms. Fans or other mechanical equipment would be one, wind would be another, and then stack effect would be another uh, ma major mechanism for pushing air through a house. Um, stack effect is generally a big deal in buildings that are taller than houses, but it's still a consideration in houses. It still works. So let's look at fans first. The simple scenario is a single bathroom exhaust fan sucking moist air out of the house. Um, an exhaust fan like that creates a negative pressure in the house, meaning that air is being sucked into the house to replace the air that's being sucked out or blown out, depending on how you think about it. So where does that, in, that replacement air come from that is sucked out? It's, it's sucked in through air leaks, unless you provide a path, a specific path for it to come through. Uh, the air leaks can be in the floor between you know, the living space and the radon filled basement or crawl space. It could be through the walls where the dead mice live, or it could be through leaky window openings um, that might just have fiberglass, pieces of fiberglass jammed around the, the, the edges. So when the fan is off, the, when the exhaust fan's off and the forced air HVAC system is running, then the house is positively pressurized. So air is being pushed into the walls from the inside, um, into the walls, roof and floor, um, through any leak that it can find. And usually there's a ton of leaks in the walls if you're not you know, taking a lot of um, steps to seal them. And this is where condensation can come from because moist, because humid air drops its moisture when it hits a cold surface inside the wall cavities. And so inside the wall, or, you know, the, the sheathing is always going to be a different temperature than the inside of the house, usually colder in, in, uh, in Minnesota, I imagine. So wind obviously can push air, it can push cold air sideways, or sideways rain can, it can push sideways rain into leaks in the outer envelope. Um, because wind can push against one side of a house, it ends up creating a negative pressure on that side, and then, but also a positive pressure on the other side of the house, which is like how bicyclists can draft behind each other, right? The, the negative pressure on the front runner pulls the second biker along more easily. The, the, the front runner has positive pressure on the front of them and negative behind them. Um, same sort of thing happens to houses. Um, only it's it's more complicated because wind moves around in circles. So you know your roof can be sucking air out, and the the walls can be pushing it in. And it um, so there's just the point is that there's a lot that can be going on with air movement. Stack effect is more predictable, but it's relentless. It's uh, it increases dramatically with height, um, and it's based on the principle that warm air is more buoyant than cold air, so it rises. The further up it rises, the faster it pulls in replacement air. And it's basically why fireplaces don't really heat buildings. So water movement. Um, water, I kind of think, is cooler than air because or heat 
because its molecular properties are different than any other liquid. It can do some really crazy stuff that mo other sort of mere mortal liquids can't do, um, except mercury, that stuff's even cooler than water. Um, surface tension properties allow water to stick to itself and build up height. Um, and that's how it can travel from, you know, from the ground to the top of a redwood tree. There's no batteries in a tree. Um, it just pulls itself up through tiny tubes in the tree. Um, and so the basic rules of plumbing, shit flows downhill and paydays on Friday, illustrate how gravity works, which is one of the major uh, physical forces that affect how water works. Carpenters understand it. Uh, plumbers use levels to get things not flat so that they know that gravity will be working for them. You know, rain falls from the sky, seeps down into the ground. That's all gravity. And you knew that. Water can also go up, though, um, against gravity, like as in the redwood tree example or any tree, um, through capillarity. When the size of the tube that the water's in is smaller than the meniscus of the liquid, the liquid climbs up the tube. So it's not, and it doesn't have to be a tube either. It could be two, it could be siding pushed against a weather barrier that's got, that's not far enough apart to break the, the capillary action. So it's not really anti-gravity, but it's not not anti-gravity, I think. Um, water also exists in vapor form, as you know, like when you boil water in a tea kettle, you can see steam shooting out of the whistling hole, but water doesn't need to be at a boiling temperature to make vapor. You know, water in a glass will evaporate into the room as long as the air is dry enough, um, which is as long as the air is less than 100% relative humidity because the water in the glass is 100%, right? So it's always going to move from more to less on that concentration. So water molecules are always mixed with the air at pretty much all temperatures, um, at least all temperatures that living things are exposed to. Warm air can hold more moisture than cold air. And that's one thing that you can learn by staring at a psychrometric chart. You can probably also learn how much you hate psychrometric charts by staring at the psychrometric chart. Um, it's also illustrated by condensation on a single pane window or frost on the underside of a roof sheathing. Um, moist, warm, moist air leaking into the, the roof cavity or the, the attic is going to drop all of its cool, uh, all of its moisture on the cool roof surface. And if it's chilly enough, it'll freeze. So that's how water moves in buildings, up, down, and sideways. Unfortunately, heat, air, and moisture are always working together. So stack effect is a good example of heat driving air movement, basically convection. Um, and then not only can this make a house more drafty, but it can also dry a house out because the air, um, the inside air is, is, um, has more moisture in it and is getting sucked out and is being replaced by cooler dry air getting sucked in. So another good example of all three working together is cold windows and warm rooms. So the warm air in the middle of the room can hold more moisture than cool air at the surface of the window. So the air sheds water molecules as it comes into contact with the window, which turn into droplets and fall under their weight due to gravity. Those are examples of heat driving air movement, which can cause comfort and heating bill problems. So just like heat causes air movement, air causes water movement or air moves water around. As the air gets warmer, it can hold more moisture and a lot of air or a lot of moisture rides around on those convection currents that we talked about. So if air were a bucket, a warm bucket would be bigger than a cold bucket. So if you have a five gallon bucket that's basically full of water, say 99% full, and someone turns the heat up, then the bucket gets bigger, but there's still the same amount of water in it, right? So now it's only 75% full and it still has five gallons of water in it. That's basically what relative humidity is. Um, and this is a psychrometric chart. It shows graphically how moisture and air behave at different temperatures. This image is from the EPA Water Management Guide, which is a really great resource. Um, you, can you can probably find it on their website. Uh, I will have a link to the water management guide. 
in uh, some cl class materials that we'll send out to you through email after this is all done. The outer curve um, indicates where the vapor liquid boundary is. It's labeled saturation curve on this image, which seems pretty obvious. It's what we call the dew point. Um, condensation happens when moisture in the air, vapor, hits a cool enough surface to convert the vapor into water. Moisture condenses from a gas to a liquid, drips into a puddle, grows into a problem. So dew point is the practical application basically of relative humidity, the temperature at which moisture in the air becomes water on a window or a beer glass or inside supply ducts. So one interesting relationship between relative humidity and dew point is that our, as the humidity, as the relative humidity goes up, dew point squeezes itself closer and closer to the air temperature. So this is illustrated on the chart by the lines getting closer together um, on the graph and then, but, but you can also just sort of picture the bucket, right? If the water level approaches the top, as the water level approaches the top, the point at which it will overflow gets a lot smaller, right? So if, if, if the, the, it's a five gallon bucket with basically five gallons of water in it, a couple of drops might send it over the edge. If it's a much bigger bucket with five gallons of water in it, you can pour you, you know, a bunch of cups in there and it's not gonna go over the edge. So in the real world at 90% relative humidity, the dew point is about three degrees cooler than the air temperature. So if the temperature shifts three degrees, the air can shed a lot of water inside the walls or roof. Um, three degree shifts in temperature are pretty common pretty much everywhere in the world. So high humidity situations need to be taken seriously, especially if you couple it with high temperature, like summertime um, or, or like just about anywhere in climate zone one or two. So moisture vapor can come from inside or outside a house, usually both. It just depends on the season, which is the main driver. Um, Interior moisture sources are predominantly from people and the stuff that they do, uh, cooking, washing floors, washing clothes, drying clothes, drying firewood in the basement. Exterior sources are predominantly from the water cycle, rain, groundwater, floods, ice storms, humidity. Uh, damp basements and crawl spaces can also add a ton of moisture to the interior moisture load if they're not sealed up properly. Um, and they can bring along radon with them. So you can manage indoor moisture vapor mechanically with dehumidifiers and air conditioners and bath fans, but you can, also, you can also open a window if the air outside isn't more humid than the air inside. Um, but uh, from the, I hope this is obvious desk, damp basements and crawl spaces should be dried with construction techniques before relying on fans. You know, it's better to fix the problem than to ventilate the, the symptoms and hope for the best. So all of that stuff brings us to the practical information and what we'll sort of queuing up for the rest of the day, how to control it all so that it's not a problem for you or your customers. At the beginning of this, I mentioned Dr. Joe's control layers he also has a game that he likes to play with young architects and engineers who want to join his company. It's called the pen test. In the pen test, you have to take a set of your own blueprints and draw the water control layer, the air control layer, and the thermal control layers with different colored pens. If you have to lift the pen from the page, you fail. So the point is that the control layers must be continuous. And so here's a little animated video that I made illustrating the concept of the pen test. Um, the specific example comes from a builder who is relatively local to your area, Michael Anschel of OA Design Build in Minneapolis. The core concept is if you can't draw where the boundary is, the boundary doesn't exist. Um, and in this animation, I use red lines to show heat leaks, blue lines to show water control leaks, and purple to show air leaks. Stopping leaks in houses begins with stopping leaks on paper. The joint between foundation and the earth is a place where water can move through capillarity and heat can flow through conduction. 
Insulation below a slab will stop most of the heat flow, but often the edges are not completely detailed, which paves the way for damp, cold floors. If the air leak is in the slab, it can draw soil gases and radon into the living space. The wall framing represents an uninsulated bridge to the outdoors. Air can leak through joints between studs, plates, and plywood. Windows amount to three-dimensional holes that can be tricky to visualize, but they need to be sealed against water, air, and heat leaks. Gaps along the perimeter really add up, so it's smart to go the extra mile inside and out. The roof wall connection is like the other spots, thermal bridges and three-dimensional air passageways. Spray foam insulation in a stud cavity is a great way to seal the cavities, but it won't solve the thermal bridging problem or the problem of air leaks through gaps in framing. That can be done with a layer of rigid insulation on the outside. Of course, thickening the walls means rethinking how they align and moving the wall, in this case, solves the thermal bridge problem at the bottom of the wall. Where walls and floors meet can hide many more leaky spots. To solve the problems at the slab, make sure it's isolated with insulation and the walls are sealed to the floor. The huge capillary connection can be solved with the paint-on waterproofing over the footing before the wall is poured and covering the inside of the stem wall after it's poured. Filling gaps and connections between building materials in wall, floor, and roof assemblies can improve home performance and help you pass the pen test with flying colors. Okay, so insulation is the thermal control layer. If it's between the studs, it's not continuous. Continuous is better for everything. The air control layer can be anything or many things in the assembly that stop air. Spray foam between the studs will stop airflow, but again, the top and bottom plates are, are still thermal nosebleeds, as are the studs, um, and the gaps between the plates are still air, air leaks. Plywood wall sheathing is a great air control layer as long as there's not a bunch of gaps and holes in it. So taping the seams is a great idea regardless of whether it's the, you know, the zip system plywood or wall sheathing or they're just regular OSB or plywood. Sometimes, you know, a lot of times when um, a porch roof is laid over an existing roof or it butts against a wall, framers will leave out one or two sheets of plywood because the main roof from the main roof because the porch roof will cover it but that cr can create a huge hole in the air barrier that nobody really plans for or expects. So it's important to think about the air control layer beginning at the slab because soil gases can get sucked into houses and that can make people sick. The water control layer is most likely the siding and roofing, um, but underground it also needs some sort of a paint on damp proofing or gravel or both. Like under the slab in that drawing, there was rigid foam, which is waterproof and will stop capillarity, but the gravel underneath it will prevent the foam from ever even seeing any capillary action. So the concept is simple, but you know, the pen, of the pen test, but it's a little trickier than it looks. Um, and it, but it's certainly less tricky to work out on paper than you know, in the field at the top of a ladder. So that takes us basically to the end of this first section, the building blocks of BS, building science. I'll just recap. To recap, heat moves in three ways, almost never in only one of those ways at a time. Um, it's almost always a combination. Um, and, a, and a good example is, you know, radiant floor heat actually heats floors through convection, which is pumping liquid through a tube and conduction when the tubes are in contact with the subfloor. The floors, you know, then radiate heat into the room, which can create convective loops in the room, and it warms surfaces that it's touching, like the couch is sitting on the floor, so it'll warm the, the couch through conduction because it's touching the couch. When you walk on it barefoot, you're experiencing conductive heat flow again. You're not experiencing radiant flow, yet everyone keeps calling them radiant heat, heat floor heating. Um, Hydronic would be the better term for that. Moisture is tricky because there are different forms subject to different laws of physics. 
vapor doesn't obey gravity and neither does liquid if it's sitting in a small enough tube. Most of the moisture to worry about in houses really is bulk water leaks, which is usually cured with flashing and humidity air leaks or humid air leaks, condensation, dumping moisture in a cold wall or roof cavity. And air also moves multiple ways uh, from fins or fans or mechanical equipment, wind and natural pressures like stack effect. These mechanisms cause pressure differentials on each side of a wall or roof, which can suck moisture into that wall or roof and lead to bugs, mold and rot or BMR. The point is that they all work together following the laws of physics, specifically that when there's two bodies of different temperature close enough to each other, they'll tend toward equilibrium. So the hot one gets cooler and the cool one gets hotter until they're both warm. Building scientists like Dr. Joe simplify it even more. They said heat goes from more to less. And for the same reason, water does that too, because water is moved carrying heat. So heat goes from more, more to less, water goes from more to less. An example is when a brick wall gets rained on, the surface moisture hits the, hits the brick, it wicks its way inward in toward the dry brick, especially if it's warmer inside the, inside the house than outside. When the sun comes out, it heats up the outside face of the brick, it dries the brick off, and then the moisture that's inside the brick moves back toward the outside where it's warmer and drier. If there's air conditioning inside the brick wall, it might actually be pulling the moisture in because it, because of the the, the vapor drive of the, um, the 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 drier air inside that the moist that the air conditioning is sucking the moisture out of can actually pull air in. That's a bigger problem in the south than where you live. Basically, they all operate differently together, and they can change their behavior when conditions shift. So links to all of the videos in this presentation and further reading will be emailed out to you a little while after class, as I said. In the meantime, uh, if you wanna, you know, if you're really hungry for more information after class, you can uh, go to buildingscience.com and look around for an article called Understanding Walls. It's got a, it's a, it's a great talk about control layers and how they work. Um, the rain control article also speaks specifically about rainwater in a lot of different assemblies. Uh, there are also a lot of deep articles about vapor, but I'd suggest going looking for the seven minutes of BS podcast for the complicated things because I think we make them easier to grasp than Dr. Joe, even though he's a funny guy, he's also an engineer who talks in big words. Um, lastly, the EPA's water management guide is a fantastic resource. It's also about a hundred pages. So there's, you know, construction details, uh, case studies, and um, lots of great examples and reasons why this stuff works. 